Tuesday. Tuesday, we are having our Periscope series. Today is the second edition of our Periscope series. And in today's edition of our Periscope series, we are periscoping the Liberian government, the ruling CDC, the leaders, and also the political actors in this government. In continuation of this Periscope series, we have brought in two outstanding gentlemen as our panelists to Periscope the CDC, the government and eight leaders, both in the government and also in the party. And so folks in cyberspace, thank you for joining us. We will ask you to hit that share button. And at this time, we will go to our panelists. We have in studio as we speak, Mr. George P. Lomo as our chief periscoper for today's edition of our Periscope. Mr. Josh Lobo, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. All right. That is the man that uh, George Preston Lobo. And also, we have in the house uh, Dr. Kula. Dr. Kula will be the analyst in this Periscope series. Uh, Dr. Kula, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thanks for having me um, again to analyze and Periscope our government. I look forward to a very uh, healthy discussion and I hope the uh, government spokespeople along with government supporters and the opposition are watching because we will analyze our government with the eye at making sure that things improve and get better. We want Liberia to succeed, but Liberia must succeed through works and not just by words. Faith without works is dead. Thank you. Thank you, Adain. That was Dr. Kula right there. And uh, gentlemen, I think we are set yet. Uh, let us begin the Periscope series. Uh, today is the second edition. And as we said earlier, folks in cyberspace, we are periscoping our government and it leaders, us, both in the party CDC and also in the government. And gentlemen, we have a leading question here for you. And uh, the question we will start with you, uh, Mr. Lobo. Uh, what four words will you use to describe our government and why? Mr. Lobo? Uh, what four words? Let me first and foremost, uh, I thought there was going to be a formal introduction ceremony uh, section. So I just said thank you. Let me first and foremost say uh, thanks to Liberia Senior Brother Barton Kula. Uh, thanks to Focus on Liberia for such a healthy debate, uh, discussion, not a debate. Uh, hopefully that we can have a great time. I want to call on Liberians from all walks of life uh, to come and take notes and pay attention because they've been fed with a lot of lies. I hope today we'll be an eye opener for many of them. Uh, we know that the government has been heavily dedicated to, to spreading lies, to misinforming them, misleading them. So today I'm hoping that uh, this opportunity will not be missed by many of them. So thank you very much. Uh, let me go to my four words, very simple. Number one, desperate. Number two, you say words, not, not phrase, words. So words. desperate, yes. mm -hmm. desperate, Hungry, hurrying up, and failure. And why? Uh, let me get to the word desperate. The word desperate is very simple. Everybody we see in this government, one, have shown the energy, the determination, the passion to a math well. They, have, they are in such a rush that they cannot wait that from the very first day of this government taking office, that's still in the game. 
corruption began legalized, looting of state resources got to the highest extent. Uh, people amassing properties, broke people today are turning into millionaires in less than two years. So that is the desperation. The desperation to amass wealth, the desperation to get rich, the desperation to uplift their living standard instead of the people. That is why I chose the word desperate. Now let's go to the word. What was my, my second word? Oh, you said hungry. Hungry. Why are they hungry? We know that Jefferson Koji, a man who had never had a job, a man who had never had the opportunity in life to, to go to restaurants that he never would have gone to under normal circumstances. So today he feels that he needs to be there. He has not been able to have the nourishment for the past 18 years of his life. Now he's so hungry for that, that he wants to be on a stage he could never have gotten on under normal circumstances. Let's go back to Seku Galasco. When you look at Seku Galasco, he is a hungry young man. When we use the word hungry, in the Liberian terminology, it means people are eager to be where they have not been. People want to get somewhere in such a quick manner that they can't wait. So they are in hurry to get there. The other word, my, my fourth word was hurry. Why are they in a hurry? The, the first thing, the government came to power with no plan. The government has no agenda. The government is yet to tell the Liberian people where she intends to take them for the next six years. We saw the government roll out the proper agenda in October of last year. That document today, we've had the funeral service of the proper agenda, which passed away, and we had the burial ceremony. That is a dead document. So it is clear that these guys are in a hurry. They are not sure that given the level of frustration, given the level of suffering the Liberians are undergoing, that there's a likelihood that they could even come back to power. So why? So as a result of that, they want to make sure that they get everything they can get in these six years so that just in case Liberians are wise or come 2023, that when they should leave power, they can be broke, they can be hungry. That at least, so that is why they are in such a hurry. Now let's go to my last one, Phil. Why did I choose the word Phil? When a government is elected, the government is elected on the promises to its people. The government is elected to fulfill its social commitment to its citizens. Government primary responsibility is to upgrade the living standard of its people, whether through providing better health care system for them, good quality education system for them, government building infrastructure for these people, government building low-income housing projects for these people. Those are activities that government must initiate when coming to power. Unfortunately for the Liberian people, they've gotten the opposite. They have a government that is desperate, that is hungry, that is in a hurry. They have forgotten about the people. So as a result of that, they are feeling massive. As a government and as an institution, as an administration, this is why they are continuing to fill, and they will fill when their six year is completed. There will be nothing substantial, nothing concrete, Nothing tangible that these homeboys will point to that they achieve for the Liberian people. There will not be a landmark project that we will be able to look at and say, as a government, this is what they succeeded in. We know what they've done since taking power. What they've succeeded in doing for us is that they've made sure that Liberia have lost some of us international credit ratings. We've lost some of our membership on major international committees that we were sitting on. Our president today is isolated. Liberia have lost its place at the main table on the world stage. So this, these are signs and evidence of total failure. And that is why I chose the world field. They will fail as a government. Thank you so very much. That was the opening question being answered right there by the man, George Lobo. Now let's go on to our analyst. Uh, Dr. Kula, you just listened to the chief periscoper describing our government as desperate and hungry. When somebody uses the word desperate, another word comes to my mind, desperado. What's your analysis on those words that he used to describe our government? Well, I I'll take it a step further. I will use my own words and kind of cover everything that he said, basically. Uh, when I see this government, I see what the CDC stands for, right? And 
and uh, Fagon and I coined these words for them when Fagon and I used to battle them in de debates uh, back from 2011 to about 2013. The C would be for confrontational. You have a divided country. The president is always confrontational. They're always going and being reactive towards the opposition. So we have that uh, society very unstable because of that. The D for dysfunctional. It's a very dysfunctional government because a lot of the players in the government are very mediocre. Uh, they have very poor backgrounds. They're incompetent. And then the C would be for corrupt. Like he said, like the brother said earlier, they came here and it seems like they came for a situation which is a pay to play. Either you pay them to play, meaning in order to be part of the, 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 the looting of the government, you have to pay to play or to be in the game to have contracts and other things, or they themselves are going out and outright stealing like our 16 billion that quote unquote got missing. We'll get into that when we get into the economics and the 25 million that they claim to have infused into the economy to mop up uh, the excess liquidity. And then the last thing I'll say is that they're nepotistic. That would be my four words, nepotistic. So confrontational, dysfunctional, corrupt, nepotistic. Nepotistic, that speaks for itself. If you look at our government, George Weir has four of his brothers at the National Port Authority where uh, Celia Coffey Brown was probably boasting that she hired them. Uh, you have our speaker, his sister is at, in Great Britain as the ambassador, uh, the vice president, her sister is at Ministry of Health. You have the other uh, gentleman, Sherman, his wife, Ministry of Health, Kofa, his wife at uh, uh, JFK. So if you look at the government throughout, it's nepotistic. I, I got to talk about Janga Cole, the controller general of Liberia. His wife is at PPCC. Can you imagine that? That conflict of in interest? and the nepotism that's going on. And of course you have Safwa May Gray, which we understand has a very close relationship with the president. Her brother is at National Investment Commission uh, and so on and so forth. So nepotistic, confrontational, dysfunctional, corrupt is what I would summarize everything that the brother just said. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kula. Again, folks, in Savo Space, we are having a Periscope series here at Focus on Liberia. And today is the second edition of our Periscope series. And in today's edition, we are periscoping the Liberian government, the ruling CDC, and its leaders. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for you know the opening question there. Dad, thank you for your analysis. Now, let us come to... Uh, the first segment in this Periscope series, let look at the formation of the government. And Josh, you will Periscope and that will provide analysis. Let look at the We Are Cabinet. Let look at the diplomatic missions. Let look at the local government. Why do you have to share with us, looking at the three uh, section when it comes to the formation of the government? Well, you see, uh, Anthony, when a government comes to power, it begins with the overall goals and agenda of the government, uh, the president and his party. Uh, our expectations are very simple. The president will clearly state his vision, and in order to be successful, the president will formulate a cabinet that will be able to help the president achieve his goal. Uh, when you look at the CDC model, uh, the CDC is a different kind of organization. The structure upon which they came to power was based on one deception, lies, misrepresentation, uh, not based on merit, uh, meaning based on qualification experience. And you see, government itself is a public service. What we mean by public service? Public service is the best thing any citizen, is the best way any citizen can give back to her country. Because public service, it is where experienced, competent, qualified people come to give back to their country. But in Liberia, it's unfortunate that public service is where the unqualified, the incompetent, the inexperienced, unprofessional comes to steal from the people. So it is difficult. So having an institution like the CDC that 
that was never structured, that came to power based on deception. The president had formulated a cabinet filled with a bunch of incompetent, inexperienced, ill professional people. Uh, we can discuss it from the cabinet level, uh, from the diplomatic missions, uh, from the local level. We know that this government has made it very clear. The message was communicated through the vice president that when it comes to whole local government, that is either you get within the program and begin to sing praises to the king, or you get let go. We saw that happen. We saw massive dismissal in Bank in Bonn County, in that of Nima. So this cabinet has been formed based on praising, worshiping false idols. Uh, I'm just a friend from Liberia that the Lord God might not strike our country because I don't worship him. Worship him is something the Lord is strongly against. So this is how we are formed as cabinet. Now, we can go ministry by ministry. But for the sake of time, let me say this to you. The ministries and agencies, they are people who surround the president. They are the ones who carry out the president mandate. For example... The central bank governor is the guy who is in charge of the government's monetary policy. The finance minister is the guy in charge of government fiscal policy. The commerce minister is the one who controls when it has to do with price on the map. Goods coming in the country, inspecting expired goods, setting price control. Those are the function of the commerce ministry. Let's go to the agricultural ministry. Those are guys when we talk about self-reliance, when we talk about the diversification of the economy to the agriculture sector. It is the agriculture ministry responsibility to make those policy recommendations to the president for serious consideration. But what we see in this government is, is a complete job. So I can name all the ministers if I wanted to do it. But we've seen ministers who are poorly performing, not because they don't want to, but one, they don't have the ability to perform. Two, they were not given a job based on their experience and qualification to, to inherit the job. They were given a job based on lies, deception, and their willingness and commitment to praising the king. Every morning, you got a post picture of the president and say, but who is strong? So on the basis of that, people have forgotten their job discretion. We no longer have ministers formulating policy. We no longer have ministers doing their job. All we do is see ministers traveling with the president, inspecting, re-inspecting, really over-inspecting. Let's go on a diplomatic stage. The diplomatic mission is very important, even though the president is the chief diplomat of the republic. His job is to market the country. He makes the case for the country at home and abroad. The reason why we establish diplomatic relations abroad and we have embassies abroad is because the president cannot be outside all the time. So we have our missions out there. We have our embassies there. But we've seen ambassadorial positions. We've seen appointments that have been made. For example, we saw the president or chief of office staff or chief of photography in Abodo, whose daughter was appointed to the embassy in DC. We know why her qualifications are. So we can go on and on. Don't get me wrong, Silver, or, or answer. There are some dedicated Liberians who remain within the same. But we've seen those guys being chased out because some of them have refused to be party loyalists. Some of them want to do the right thing. But this government, you are not hired. You are not appointed. You are not brought in with the expectation of delivering the right thing. Your job in this government is to do the wrong thing. And the only thing you need to do is to praise the king, lie to our people, misinform them like honorable, like Eugene Falcon is doing, and then you have a job. This is why, President, we are care less about reshuffling like, because his government is not based on competence and performance. So, to be honest with you, Anthony, the people that should help the president to be able to do what he's supposed to do for the country, they are not there. And at the end of the day, our people continue to suffer. The economy is in a garbage can. We see inflation at 33%. Productivity is down. Consumer spending is down. Consumer's confidence in the financial sector is down. The educational system is crumbling. We see major health facilities, hospitals. The health minister is not doing nothing, so health sectors is down. 
So this is where we are, uh, Anthony. The government overall, like I said, will fail. Thank you, uh, Just Lobo. Uh, before I go to Dad, um, let me say this. In every government, there are key positions that you look at and then you gain hope, especially those who are on the outside. They see certain people, you know, people with credibility in your government and they say, I can do business with this government. Uh, somebody will say they want to look at who is your minister of foreign affairs. They want to look at who is your finance minister. You know, they want to look at who is your permanent representative to the United Nations. They want to look at who is your ambassador to the great United States. And all the officials in government, who is your minister of press, these people are the ones all side of look at and then make a determination that, okay, we can do business with this government. Is that the case with our government? And I want you to periscope the few individuals that I have uh, called upon. Is that for me or Baton? Let, let Baton go. That's a cool idea. Okay. All right, before I periscope those individuals that you've talked about, in fact, let me periscope those individuals that you talked about quickly. Yeah. I'll just say in a nutshell, it goes back to the word that I used, dysfunctional. The government is dysfunctional because it has a lot of mediocre, mediocre people, a lot of incompetent people, a lot of shadow people. And you have a lot of shadow and mediocre people in your government, you're going to have a dysfunctional government because these people don't know what to do. So let's take the Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, for example, Nathaniel McGill. If you look at Nathaniel McGill's resume, his resume is very thin. I don't think he's somebody that the international community has much credibility in because I've been hearing a lot of people complaining about this pay to play thing that I talked about, where you come in and you want to invest in the country and Natalia McGill says you have to pay a certain amount to him and other people before you can invest. It turns a lot of people off, especially people from America. In fact, there have been issues upon issues related to that. One point in time, it got very hot on him. He even came out and there was, there was rumors that the president was going to get rid of him. So there's no confidence there. If you look at the chief of protocol, uh, Finda Bundo, for example, from what I understand, she used to be a hairdresser. She used to do marketing and rice, you know, selling rice and stuff like that. Her resume also is very thin. So that kind of person is not somebody you would have a lot of confidence in. Um, if you look at our foreign minister, for example, our foreign minister has a sociology degree, okay, and an electrical engineering degree. He has no background in uh, foreign affairs whatsoever. In fact, he told our legislative branch that he has no background in foreign affairs. Yet, because of whatever deals he made with the president and others, uh, they went ahead and confirmed him, okay? If you look at, uh, let's say, our minister of health, uh, here in this country, our Minister of Health apparently worked as a nurse in Philadelphia. She went back home, somehow opened a clinic. I heard somebody said she one, once upon a time went to school in Liberia as a medical doctor. I'm not sure how true, it, true that is. But she does not have the credibility when it comes to working with the World Health Organization and our international partners because that's out of her league. From what I understand, she feels very uncomfortable on that setting. So if I were to go through all the list that you just made, I would continue to say that's one thing that stands true for most of them. They're mediocre and very incompetent, and it shows through. You look at Fagon, who's supposed to be putting forth the, uh, the uh, government plans and, 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 and all of the stuff that they're doing, uh, presenting it to the people, uh, public affairs. All Fagon has been doing is being reactionary, insulting people whenever... Uh, Costa comes up with something, he comes back and retorts. Uh, he does his facts and fiction. Why? Because Fagon lied to the Liberian people and said he has some degree in, a, 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 how you call it, political science. He's a political scientist. But here's a guy, he has four AA degrees. In America, nobody has four AA degrees, okay? Most people who go into political science, you do an associate's degree, 
After that, you go in, you get your undergrad in political science pre-law, and then you go to law school. That's what most people do. You take the LSAT and you go to law school. It's my understanding that Fargo probably could not even pass, uh, get out of, a, 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 how you call it, a, a, an associate or an undergrad school uh, to say before you talk about going to law school. So you have this mediocre person that was sitting in his wife's African store doing videos, talking politics, uh, using everything that he saw on American TV, impressed people with his big talk and his bluster. They took him, had him talk for the last part of the, the uh, campaign for, for We Are. They gave him a lot of information. He knows a lot of their personal information. And so he too started a lobby to become, first he wanted to be Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, then he wanted to be uh, Minister of Information, then finally he got the deputy position and Fago told us himself, he said he paid for it when he had that blowout with, uh, with uh, Edward Snow. He said he paid for the position and he said everything that, that was on record for everybody to hear. So the, the, the bottom line is these guys are mediocre. They have no competence. And because of that, the president's cabinet is very weak. I could go on and on and on. Thank you, Dad. Again, folks in cyberspace, this is Focus on Liberia. Uh, on our program, The Hour of Politics with me, Anson and Sia. But today, it is our Periscope series, and we are periscoping the Liberian government, its leaders, and the ruling CDC. Gentlemen, uh, you have periscoped uh, some officials of the government and the government on uh, handling of the affairs of the state. Uh, it seems to be you guys have forgotten about the president. Uh, we have to periscope everybody. And so let's go to the president. Let's also go to the party, its officials, how the party is handling you know, the government. Uh, we heard from Mamba Maru the other day. And so starting with the president, George Lobo, in terms of leadership, in terms of judgment, in terms of uniting the people of Liberia, is our president, George Mano, we are up to the task. Uh, that will that will that will bring me into my fourth war when I said uh, they will fail. Uh, the president have failed in the past, and once again he will fail again. Remember, uh, Anthony. After 2011 election, there was massive problem in the country. Liberians argue that George Weah was the only unifier on the planet and that even Jesus could not unite the Liberian people. Liberians made a case to Ellen Johnson Sully, and in her effort for reconciliation, Madam Sully appointed George as the peace ambassador, right? Yep. George Weah was stuck with the job of reconciling Liberia, uniting the country. I think. The issue of reconciling Liberia now, it has been laid to rest. Uh, President, we are, then George, we have performance was terrible. Uh, we, we know that 500,000 was allocated to him, which is lavish, wastefully spent our resources, yet to account for that money. In the interest of unity, Madam Salib allowed George to go with unity. They embattled him. All we saw George doing was to host one game with some of his former colleagues from on the international stage. How does JJ Okosha play on SKD United Liberians? Why didn't you go host a tournament between Nima and Grandier? Why you didn't do that? But instead, George is not the guy. So that part has been made. Fresh. In terms of leadership, uh, George has shown terribly throughout his life and throughout some of his establishment as a human being that he has full managerial ability. You see, the Liberian people, they will make excuses for your answer. When the Liberian men love you and like you or want you. Because Liberians are always in desperate mood to make decisions. And in desperation, you are always open to making mistakes because you are in a hurry. So Liberians were lying for George. They were creating resumes, giving him establishments. And unfortunately for us, as God would have it, let's look at George's own establishments. George Weah is a is Africa soccer icon. He is Africa soccer legend. 
the young man established a soccer team, the geo professional, they die a natural death because of poor management. That is leadership. George, we are opening his store on Romano Street there again. That store died a natural death. George, we are love to party. He opens a nightclub. That nightclub died a natural death. George, we are as the peace ambassador to the United country. George, we are as a senator, they not do nothing for Mosulado County. But the Liberian people, because of their desperation, they got him elected. As a leader now answering, I think by this time it's clear to all of us that we should not expect much. George has not exercised good judgment. George has been poorly managing the affairs of the country. This is why the other day I said that the president, we are will dedicate some of the energy and resources here to inspecting Ellen completed projects. I will ask that he take that energy and redirect it to inspecting what his ministers are doing. How are they doing the Labyrinth people job? Because he has the oversight authority. He has that responsibility at his hands. President, we are, the constitution makes it clear that all cabinet appointees, that they work at the will and pleasure of the president. So when we talk about good judgment, George Ria is the only president in the 21st century that your finance minister will allow you to mislead the world, lie on the state of the nation address, and that finance minister is saying he's doing his job. Your finance minister is the only one who infuses and is yet to account for it, but he says he has a job. You have an everyday minister for international party for some of his irresponsible, reckless, and undermining statements. He still has a job. We've heard cabinet officials who have been heard on tips soliciting bribes, actively engaged in rampant corruption, but today they still have their jobs. So the issue of, of exercise and judgment here, it's very, very clear that George don't know what he's doing. George, we are, is the only president in the 21st century who took an oath to defend the Constitution but violates the Constitution. So to that this point, I'm asking myself, does George we are comprehend? Does George we are understand his function as a president? Because it is a law in the Republic of Liberia that public officials must declare their assets. He admitted to it. He told the BBC. But up to now, what happened? It's a fiasco. So, so, so let's say, this thing here, we can't sugarcoat this. You know, this government has performed poorly. President we have shown his many disabilities as a leader. He is not organized. That's one characteristic of a good leader. You must be organized. You must be punctual. That is not part of George. You must be articulate. You must be able to communicate with your people. President, we are call a speech for the country. We are trying to write a letter to the UN to beg the president to speak to us. So at this particular point in time, uh, questioning his leadership ability, I think is an understatement. George has been a terrible leader. He is a bad leader for our country, and he will feel miserably as a leader. Thank you, George. And then let's come to our analyst, uh, Dr. Kula. Dr. Kula, uh, you just heard George Lomo right there, uh, provide some analysis on our president. And then I want you to not forget the CDC as a party, especially the chairman of the party, the youth lead chairman, and uh, go ahead and provide some analysis. Well, <clears throat> looking at the president, the periscope of the president, you want us to look at his leadership abilities, his judgment, and uniting the people. First of all, President Weah is lucky and blessed to have been given the honor to be the president of Liberia. He's the most unlikely person having come from Gibraltar. And they always want to make this known to us that the reason people are opposed to him and are fighting him in the opposition is because he's from Gibraltar. That is not true. President Weah, even though he came from Gibraltar, when Liberia was at its knees, he lifted us up. And all of us were proud of him, whether you were from Charlesville or Dixville, or you're from Ghanasville, or you're from Gibraltar, 
You were proud of him. He was a son of the land and everybody wanted the best for him. And because of that, the young people took him and said, we will make him the leader of our nation because he was not part of any of the warring factions. And they followed him. And despite the fact that he showed them over and over again, that he had no leadership abilities, that he had no ability to speak in public, because as a leader, you have to be a public speaker. That's something you do regularly. They knew he didn't know how to do that. So they told him not to debate. They knew that he had deficiencies and yet they felt that he should be the face of the young people. So for that, he must bless God and bless the Liberian people for it. Now, let's talk about education. President Weir went back to school and decided to get a master's degree. But all of us knows from how he articulates economic policies or economic discussions, he does not sound like anybody that has a master's degree. Let me let the Liberian people know that DeVry University is not one of the top universities in America. In fact, DeVry is a for-profit university. What that means is as long as you have the money to pay, you will get the degree. Whether you go there, whether somebody does the work for you or not, you will get the degree. Usually most people who are already in the working world go to DeVry and get a degree just so they can get a bump in their salary. So it's not a normal uh, university that an average student coming out of high school in this country would go to. Having said that, let's talk about his leadership abilities. As a leader, whenever you've taken a position, you are supposed to act, articulate a vision for your people. But instead, what do we see our president doing? We see our president doing something that a shallow person would do, an incompetent person would do. He goes around every day uh, with people following him and he, he delegates one little role to another. When he first came out, he started announcing the Bali Island project, the this, the that, the that, just off the bat, zinking the houses. Oh, we'll build 50 houses in 60 days. Those are things that people who don't have a long-term vision do because all they're doing right now is for, for the here and now, the optics. They want you to see that they're doing something to make it seem like they're doing something, okay? So they give you that optics of, I, I zinc the roof, I, I pay YX fees, I, I, I'm building little roads here and there. It's photo ops, it's shallow, okay? That's not leadership. Now, in terms of judgment, this president, when he first took over, he went and broke down his house on 9th Street and started building a fabulous mansion. He started doing all these other things, building that fabulous uh, villa. Some people say it's 21 buildings. Some people say it's 16. Some people say it's 17. Some people say 47. We can't get the number, but he, he went ahead and uh, dedicated his church. He dedicated his theater. Now, any person that knows anything about leadership, about being in the public eye, about having a judgment call, will tell you that the optics of doing such a thing looks very bad. And for people to come out and say, oh, the man made $80 million when he was in uh, playing soccer, that's a, a lie. I was about to use another word. That's a lie. Most soccer players that make $80 million and that have that kind of money, they don't wait for the Liberian government to give them money to renovate their house before they start putting new furniture in after they took over. They use their own money to renovate their house, okay? Most people with that kind of money don't wait for them to become uh, president of Liberia before they have their wife leave her job and then come down to Liberia, put her on our on our budget with $1.5 million of Liberia taxpayer money and start talking about she's a, he, she's a humanitarian. So for that judgment, the judgment call of him doing those things, of him building that complex, the office building that he gave to the uh, female journalists and all of that, the church, the optics is bad, especially if you don't declare your access, assets by making them public. Now they argue and say, oh, you, all you have to do is declare them. You don't have to make them public. Okay, you don't have to make them public. It's, it's not the law. But if you say you got all this money, why can't you show it on paper to the library people that you have this $85 million that you say you have? The reason is because he does not have it. And all I challenge the Liberian people to do is go back and look at his 2005 
uh, asset declaration and look at his 2014 when he went to the Senate asset declaration form, you will realize that this man is not worth no 85 million. Okay, he was struggling. So judgment was poor. Now unity. Let's talk about unity. This man was head of the uh, what was the name of the commission? The was that? The reconciliation. Yeah, the reconciliation to bring us together. Now, <laughs> as a reconciler, as somebody who, when the war was going on, he helped UNICEF with, um, you know, the disarmament and all of that, you would think that this man would not be about <laughs> the us versus them, the CDC versus opposition, calling uh, uh, critics uh, uh, enemies of the state, you know, making retorts at, at uh, Jonathan Pelele that while I was fighting for what you call it, you were doing this and scaring the man. He won't be going in the church and, and, and blasting at librarian people instead of speaking to them, you know, belittling them, putting them down, talking down to them, browbeating them. That's not what a unifier does. If the, the, the country is divided as a leader and a unifier, you're supposed to bring the country together. But all I see him doing is trying to unify CDC because he wants to win the next election. So he wants to make sure Moaba Malu is in his camp and not telling people all the different things that he knows about him. That's not what you do. You, you unify the whole nation. The same strength that he took to say, oh, uh, Moaba Malu was angry. You know, people talk when they're angry. Why can't you say that about Costa? Maybe Kosa is angry. That's why he's insulting me. Maybe Kosa is upset at something I'm doing. That's why he's insulting me. Instead, he's my little brother. Let me bring him under the fold and say, okay, Kosa, you're not satisfied with this, but you cannot uh, dictate to me as president. These things that you said to me, I will look at them and I will decide what on this list I can do and what I can't do. But I want to do it across the board for the entire country, not for just cop, but for opposition, the, the independents, everybody as a nation. I want to bring everybody together. Let's sit under a tent and unify ourselves. That's what a leader does. But a shallow person, a vindictive person, a person that doesn't have vision for the country, they do what President Weah is doing. You pick and choose who you listen to. You pick and choose who you like. You, the CDC got different law. Yaga Koliba got different law. Uh, 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 Costa is treated different from somebody else who was found doing corruption and all of this. You know. That's what goes on when you don't have a leader. And we're, we're suffering because we have a serious deficit at the top and we have it throughout the cabinet. Now you talk about the chairman. The chairman is one of those people I respect. Boba Mull is articulate, he's smart, he reads well, he's a strategist. Everything that Boba Mull said is the truth. It's the same thing that, that, that uh, uh, Costa has been saying it, but because Costa has been insulting him and belittling him, they don't want to hear it. Librarians don't like to hear the truth, and they especially don't like to hear the truth when you're cussing them while you're telling them the truth, okay? But everything Moba Mola said is the truth. And Moba Mola, as a chairman, I think he's in the right position. Moba Mola could be fit, to be honest with you, he could be fit for any position in that government. He is one of the people that I look at that are, that are very competent in that government. For whatever reason, he's somebody that's very astute. Some people just have it naturally, and I think he does. Now, let's talk about Koji. Koji is misaligned. Koji should not be mayor of Monrovia. Koji's strength is organizing the youth. I think they should find something for Koji where he's mobilizing and organizing the youth, whether something in TVET uh, at the Ministry of Youth and Sports or something in the Ministry of Youth and Sports. That's where he belongs. I don't think... Uh, running a municipality is where he belongs. He doesn't know what he's doing. He was on a, uh, um, a forum in the United States talking about municipal municipalities in, in Africa and, and the fella didn't even know what he was talking about. So I think he's really misaligned. Uh, that's, that's basically my analysis on that, unless you have something else you wanted me to add. Thank you again, folks, in cyberspace. This is Focus on Liberia on our program, The Hour of Politics with me, Anthony C.A. We have resumed a month long Periscope series, and this is the second edition. And we are periscoping the Liberian government, the ruling CDC, and all of the officials therein. 
Folks in cyberspace listening to us in this Periscope series, we critically analyze what our government is doing. That is the essence of the Periscope series. We also provide unique critique. It is good. Some people don't see it that way that we criticize our government in a more constructive way. We point out their weaknesses. We point out their strength when we see it so that we will know how they are leading us. And it's an opportunity for them too, to see how we see them so that they can make improvement. So the government of Liberia, if you have any concern with all that we are trying to say here, you can reach out to us here at Focus on Liberia and we'll give you the opportunity to respond. So folks in cyberspace, this is the goal of this Periscope series. If you just join us, welcome as we go into the other segment of our conversation. Uh, Mr. Lobo, we come back to you. Yes. This time around, in this segment, we'll be talking about good governance. On our good governance, we have few pillars. We'll be looking at accountability and transparency. And I hope you're taking note. And we're looking at the merit system. You remember our big brother, Akara Gray, have been going around telling us they're cleaning the mess. Are they actually cleaning the mess? We will be looking at the rule of law, the justice system on the CDC government. Is it functional? We'll also be looking at the national legislature on the CDC government. But let me give you two first. Go for accountability, transparency, and cleaning the mess. The rule of law, the justice system, on the CDC government, and later we'll go to the uh, national legislature, we'll deal with that separately. Go ahead, my dear brother. All right, so let me follow the order in which it came. Uh, accountability, transparency, and the merit system, cleaning the mess. Let me take those questions for You see, I want to thank uh, Bartom Kula there for his brilliant analysis on Koji. Uh, I know that wasn't given to me, it was for him. Uh, I think he made it very clear that he should not be running a municipal. Uh, that guy should be somewhere. Uh, in all fairness, I just wanted to go there real quick. I think uh, George William must establish what a Chancellor had called Yoda. The guys that used to be Yoda Youth Service cleaning the streets, Koji is good with that. I think running an administration is too big for him. But when we talk about good governance and accountability, the reason why I started off with Koji we saw credible information recently where the IMF stopped a $50,000 payment to Koji. This is a young man who has never had a job in his life, who has never been a professional. The man, is, the man runs the largest city in the country that hosts 1.5 million people. But this man is angry every day. Because as a professional, he does not know how to carry himself. He is rampant, corrupt, rampant, the corrupt. Uh, he has a mind well to the point that we can't even say it now. The other day, someone I, I sent someone close to Jefferson Koji House down 18th Street. I was shocked to know that Jefferson Koji put a fence around the house and he took the fence way up. But you see, when we talk about accountability, you know, the Liberian men believe that accountability is just telling us. That is not all. Accountability in itself is an act of transparency. Why do you want to be accountable? You want to be accountable because you want to show that your hands are clean. You want to be able to convince us that you are doing the right thing, right? So you are accountable. We give you $10. You say, gentlemen, this is where the $10 is. We bring us it. The reason why the bank sends you financial statements it's because the bank wants to be accountable. The bank wants to show transparency. But unfortunately for us under this government uh, answer, we know that accountability is a norm. It, it is a taboo under this government. You cannot work in this government and be accountable and live long in this government. You'll get out. You'll be fired. Uh, let me give you some basic evidence to that. Matthew Ines was mad that the government had put down $7 million down payment on a private jet for the president. He wanted to tell the investigators, that's accountability. So what happened to him? He's delayed today. Matthew Ines expressed his frustration and said, no, this is not how MAPO should be done. 
They should be done through the financial institutions. What happened to it? He's gone. Because this government accountability is a taboo. President, we are keen to power legalizing corruption. And as long as you work within that framework, then you have a job. So we can, look, let me tell you, Anthony. If you go back to my page in 2018, I posted one day and I said, I said, asking George we are to be accountable is less asking a cat you gave a basket full of rats and said, take care of them for me. That is how the Liberian people act into court. You took rats and put it in a basket and gave it to the cat and said, do accounting work for me. That is not fair. The man have been corrupt from the time he came to power. Before he came to power. Look, you see, sometimes when I hear Liberians telling us that George loved the country, when you cut him, the blood that will spill out will be, will be spelling Liberia, Liberia, Liberia. Okay, this man, you told us, he's worth 85 million. If this man wanted to be accountable to the people and to show transparency, this man would have made us to see the documents to show that he was worth 85 million. But unfortunately, George, we are no, no, no. His 85 million, the astronomer then left it up to Mars. We have to file a lawsuit to go see it. Okay. Now, George is in power. A leader who wants to be accountable, who wants to show transparency. The reason why I will always just talk about the leader is because. The leader will set the tone that his subordinates will follow. You see, in management or answering, there's a phrase that I love. They said the manager seeks voluntary participation of his subordinates. They say, how does he do it? By assigning great deal of responsibility to them so that they know that they are part of the organization. The manager gave them something to do. So let me tell you, answer. If George had come to power and wanted to be transparent and wanted to be accountable, President Weir would have declared his asset, made it public like Ellen. President Weir, let me tell you why. His subordinates have not declared their asset because they truly believe that he did not declare his asset. We saw that in Sierra Leone. When President Julius Manabio declared his assets in the effort of transparency, we saw the picture. And then subsequently, we saw the fight against corruption. But for us, no, we didn't see that. The president declared his assets, even though we have a law in rent us the right to obtain all public information. George, we are since you don't know, because for you, I know you don't understand your job description. Your job is to uphold the constitution. And it is a law in the country. The freedom, of, the freedom of Information Act. Once you get any information that belongs to the government, it is a public information service. You do not go and place a guard stay on it. It's only because you don't want to be transparent. It's because you don't want to be accountable. Now, to make matters worse, we've seen you amassing wealth. We've seen you flying love zeros on, on, on private jets. We see what you're doing across the country. And you see, Anthony, based on the leadership that George, the tune that just said, his subordinate continued to follow. Now we see Fina Bono building a mansion. We see Samuel to a mansion. We see Nathaniel McGill's mansion. So there's nothing about accountability under this government. Okay? So here is the problem about this issue of accountability. The Liberian people are struggling. The economy is in terrible condition. You see, when we, the business guy, tell the government that the government is responsible to create an enabling environment, what do we mean by that? An enabling environment is an environment that shows to investors or potential business people that you can bring your money and invest it in this country, that your money will be saved, that nobody will unrob you, that there will be rule of law if somebody borrow your money and you pay back, you can take them to the court and get redress. So how do we know that by, by, that will happen? The government must demonstrate that it is accountable. The government must show that it is transparent. So George, we are the reason why you are having problems attracting investors is because you cannot do these things. You infuse 25 million 
is yet to be accountable. You the 16 billion, your own government money. You clear the continent for the boat, the money went missing. The money was escorted by the Liberian National Police under the leadership of your police director. You were appointed. Up to now, the president pretend I have to say he don't know what happened to our money. So, so why should a foreigner trust that your own money will get missing and you'll get something out of it? The government own money went missing. They can't account for it. And your own money go missing, you they will account for it. So the government is not transparent. Now let's go to the marriage system. You see, when we talk about marriage system, it is a, it is a society where you are giving a contract or you are giving a piece of job or you are giving an appointment because you have the experience, you have the requisite credential to do it. Sadly for us, George Mia is the only president that I know who appoints people with no experience in that area, with no understanding in that area, do not have the qualification for that area. So at the end of the day, his government is not on a merit basis. It is one based on regional affiliations, party affiliation, sick offense, deceptions, lies, and misleading the people. Anthony, let's be factual here for once. You know, sometimes I don't know how Liberians take this from government officials. We heard a tape. We heard a tape. If you remember the tape from National Housing Authority, on that tape went for that leak about Duana Sayon. In that tape, we heard that the justice minister was involved in that scandal. We also heard that the president was involved in that scandal. We know that the Minister of State for Presidential Affairs was involved in that We also know that the Finance Minister was a complicit in that scandal. What have happened to them today? And they are saying, going. so is this government a transparent government? What they did was they used Duana Senior as the sacrificial lamb, and then they let it go and cover it up. So you cannot be transparent like that. Jefferson Cody was going to to Toyota, he hit a lady. A car totally destroyed. That car cost us forty-five thousand. Somebody mother, somebody sister, somebody auntie got killed in the process. What happened to the investigation? It was swept under the rug. Is this a government that is transparent? Is this the government that you can say they are accountable to you? Look, I can sit here and continue to to spill out and, and expose this government recklessness and bad governance. But I'll say this to you, good governance itself, it's not one thing, it's doing all the things right. For those of you who have cars, we usually say all Salinas must be firing. You must have a police director who's responsible. You must have a finance minister who understand the fiscal policies issues. You must have a central bank governor who can roll out comprehensive monetary policy reform. You must be able to have a commerce minister who is dedicated to tackling price control. Not your friends to go practice soccer. Not your homeboys to go travel and go drink like Kaye in Abidjan. Not bunch of people to go to China to carry you to the shower in temple because you are in looking town. You used to watch karate show. You want to see where it's made. That is not why you travel. So when we talk about good governance, there's a lot of different things that we look at. So at this particular point in time, this government in my forwards, all they performing, and we do not see any signs of progress. Thank you. That was George Lobo there, periscoping the government on the issue of accountability, transparency, the merit system, and cleaning the best, and also the rule of law and the justice system on our President George Manawia. We will now go to Dr. Kula, who is our chief policy analyst here, to analyze what George Lobo has said. Dr. Kula. Well, just to give an analysis on good governance and all of the inherent things that come with good governance. If you have a govern government that's a good government for its people, that government usually have those things that you just outlined. 
It's transparent. It's accountable to its people. It has a merit system. It has a good justice system. The judicial system works, right? That's what we consider a good government. Well, in the case of this government that's presently in place, we have a situation where our president came to power and the first thing he sought to do was to get rid of those integrity institutions that keep our governance good, right? Like the PPCC, the code of conduct, all of those things that would keep the government in checks and balances like a strong legislative branch. So what do you have? A weak legislative branch wherein the legislators basically do what the president wants because the president has them under his control in the sense that most of those guys, whether it be it in the opposition or with the current, with the ruling party, either their wives have been appointed in positions by the president or their relatives have been appointed in positions by the president. And therefore, they do the president's bidding. So the legislative branch is weak. When you look at the judicial system, the justice system, which is supposed to be where we go for our laws, our Supreme Court that is supposed to be strong and the final arbiter of justice, that has also been weakened by this president because what happened? One of the main guys in his party, Akaris Gray, who I would consider a friend because I used to talk to him from time to time, he decided to go after Justice Johnny because Justice Johnny uh, issued a statement that wasn't favorable to them. He had a descending voice. So they went after Justice Jenna and they got Justice Johnny out. Now you have a Supreme Court, which is really a Supreme Court controlled by the president. And I see a situation where this ICOP, the independent COP led by Newville is now quote unquote taking his case to the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court can give a declarative judgment on whether we need to ask the justice minister for a permit before we can protest. I see that all as a ploy, all as a game uh, that these CDC guys are doing where he takes it to the Supreme Court. And of course the Kapal bench is eventually gonna come down with a ruling that says, you have to go to the justice minister for a permit and the justice minister decides where you go to protest and whatnot. And I see this government going step by step to push all of the freedoms that we have had under the Ellen Johnson administration, all the freedoms that we've worked for over the years, they're gonna push them back little by little by little until the president is the only man standing. So when it comes to good governance, I'll say this government is failing at good governance. It's failing at a good integrous government. It's failing at a good accountable government and it's filling at a government that has a judicial system or merit-based system or any of those systems that you would think would, would make a good government. Uh, let's look at some specific examples. The Crow report that came up about the 16 billion and the GAC report that came, about, came out talking about the 25 million. If you read those reports, you will see blatant corruption, blatant corruption, yet nobody has been brought to book for those things. How in the world can you take millions of dollars from the central bank, take it in a car and say you're taking it to the vendors on the street to go and divide the money from them and take the librarian dollars from them? I've never seen that anywhere in any banking system in this world. And then what they listed as given to the uh, vendors and what the vendors actually receive are two different things. So the variances, in some cases, you have variances of $2 million, variances of $3 million, variances of $9 million. One guy in Team 6 he got $11 million. Why has that guy ha have not been called by any any? Uh, uh, any NSA or the police or, or the justice minister, anybody to this day, we don't hear anything. They say it's still sitting now at LACC, sitting now at LACC, waiting for what? For the president to tell them what to do? I don't understand that. That's not good governance. If you look at what happened with Yeke Koloba, where it was obvious to us that the police director planted a gun in Yeke Koloba's car because Yeke is a critic of the government. 
That's not good governance when you're picking on people who are critics of you. Yet you have in the same country, Jefferson Koji, who was accused of attacking people in District 10 and District 15, and yet nothing has happened. He was never called. You have people like uh, 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 Safa Norman and Ofori Dia and all these guys being around the protests and nobody's calling them to book. Nangbe going and trying to close down Costa's radio station. Nobody brings him to book. So there's selective justice for one group of people because they're critics and others because they're either supporters of the government or they're in the government, nothing happens to them. When Moba Molu said that he saw, before this new tape came out, he said he saw trucks carrying money from the bank. He was never called for questioning. Now his recent tape has come out where he accused the president of taking monies whenever he goes on trips, taking money that should come to Liberian government. He's taking it and using it on his projects. Nobody has called him for questioning. Nobody has called anybody for questioning about the girl that was appointed, girl called Ice Cream that was appointed by the president, a driver, appointed by the president at a top level from a driver because he's sleeping with a girl. That's not good governance. So when it comes to anything about good governance, cleaning up the mess, what mess can my friend Akaris Gray tell me they have cleaned up? We expected change and we expected actual change. We didn't expect change for the sake of replacing one group of corrupt people for another group of corrupt people or having just a select group around the president get a mass wealth. We didn't, like, we didn't want change for that. So you have to tell me what mess are we cleaning up? I don't see the mess that we're cleaning up. Again, folks in cyberspace, this is Focus on Liberia on our program, The Hour of Politics with me, Anselin C.A. In today's edition of our Periscope series, we are periscoping the Liberian government, the ruling CDC, and all the leaders therein. Josh Lobo is comfortably seated. He is the chief periscoper. And Dr. Kula is also seated. He is the chief analyst in this Periscope series. Don't go away. We are here periscope in the government. And we want to remind people within the government, if there's anything you listen to here that you're not satisfied with, our phone numbers are open. Reach out to us and we'll bring you in so you can have your say or you forever hold your peace. Gentlemen, let us talk about the national legislature on George We Have. Uh, let us be a little brief so that we can be able to cover the other segment. Josh Lomo, to your credit, you coin a word called legislator. What are you thinking? Tell me about uh, the national legislature, the first branch of government under this administration. Are those guys providing the checks and balances for which they were elected? You know, you know, Anthony, it is not only heartbreaking and frustrating. I feel for the Liberian people that they trust the wrong people, that they look up to the wrong heroes, they celebrate the thieves, looters, unprofessional criminals, irresponsible people to represent. You know, when I was growing up, Anthony, as a young man, I thought I would be an economist one day. This is why even on my free time, I'm always reading around the world, trying to understand what is happening. Yesterday, I was reading on the Bitcoin, finding other investments, opportunity around the world to invest. I always knew that the lawmakers, thank God for my teachers in, in junior high. I remember I took civics when I was in St. Lawrence Catholic School. And as the teacher, one of my, one of my teachers, Mr. Bukala, said, he used to teach civics and geography. And Mr. Bukla did very well in informing us as students on the roles and responsibilities of government. And he also told us the functions of the first branch of government. He gave us the roles and responsibility of the lawmakers. So whenever I see a lawmaker, whenever I hear about the word legislature, I was taught that it is the first branch of government. It is the branch of government that has the oversight responsibility over the executive branch. And the Constitution also says that when the executive and the legislature have a problem, 
Then the third branch of government, which happens to be the judiciary, is the one that comes in to interpret the law. That is the point. Unfortunately for us, Liberians have been so desperate. They've been let down so many times to the point nowadays that even if you dress today, if you took a cat and dressed that cat nicely with her, people might like the vote for that cat because they are desperate. And I continue to tell my people there will be no shortcut out of this problem. These problems are real. The more you elect the wrong people, the more you worsen the situation. I refer to our lawmakers as legislators. Those guys have been the typical example of wasteful spending of public resources. Why do I refer to them as the example of wasteful spending public resources? Public resources must be used to benefit the people. If we had lawmakers who were representing the interests of the people, and we were paying them to do the job for the people, then it makes sense. But we have lawmakers who are misrepresenting the people, who are working against the interests of the people, but they're getting paid for the people. That in itself, that is an act of looting. You are taking something for a job you are not doing. All we see now is that the legislative branch of government work at the will and pleasure of the president. I thought, according to the Constitution, it was cabinet ministers who were to be working at the will and pleasure of the president. Just to confirm what I'm saying, this morning I read a story in the paper. Former County Senate uh, Representative Edwin Melvin Snow, he admitted that for the past two years they have been on a honeymoon. Look, let me tell you, fellow Liberians, I don't care how many mansions Edwin Snow built in my community. If I was in that district, before I vote for Edwin Snow, that means I should go and come back in. That statement is an admittance of not doing nothing for you. So for two years, these guys were merrymaking, were exploiting you folks. But today, what are you saying? Oh, the men build farm. The men build us in Bonnie. Listen, continue to do it. You let him again. He's going to go there for, go there for six years. So the next time he must spend four years on honeymoon and spend two years looking at the lawmakers are the ones who are supposed to keep the president in check. Are supposed to be the one to, to exercise oversight responsibility. You see, yesterday, Anthony, on my, on, my, on my platform, I told the Liberian people, you see, I don't want to be a political soothsayer, but I think I have been spot on with all my predictions. Just yesterday morning, I told Liberians, that you are celebrating the return of your lawmakers. I hope you don't cry. This morning I woke up, I saw a video of our, you know, our homeboys doing what they normally do, making noise, talking something that don't have nothing to do with the people. So the reason I refer to them as Lutus, our lawmakers have been the misrepresentation of the people. This is the first branch of government who have relinquished opposition to the executive branch. Sometimes I sit back and question my rationality. I want to ask if my teacher lied to me that the legislature was the first branch. Because when I look at Liberia, I know that the executive branch is the first branch of government in Liberia, or not George. But thank God we live in America where we see the first branch of government exercising her right. So we cannot be carried away. So at the end of the day, think about it. Our lawmakers approve a $1 billion loan agreement. In two days, answer. The country national budget is 530 million. And you, you will approve a one billion dollar agreement in two days. Did you peruse the document? Let me take the word peruse out of it. Did you read through the document? No. Our lawmakers, a senator show up, a minister show up to the capital building, they confuse. Some of them, they are, not, they are not qualified. They can't even make a statement. Neither before I say they read. We listened to the reading from the senator from Grand Cayman County, which was a complete disaster. So at the end of the day, uh, our answer, our legislature, they are not there for us. And I want to say to every Liberian, every Liberian, if you give these guys another chance, your life will never improve. 
your suffering will continue to worsen. I don't care what they've done for you in the past. It is about time you change course. It is about time you look for somebody. Let these guys go home and work in the private sector. Let them go and live the life you've been living for the last six years and nine. These guys will kill you. These guys are not helping our system. That is where I will start. They are, they are a complete disgrace to our population. Again, that was Josh Lomo right there, periscoping the national legislature. We will go to Dr. Kula, our chief analyst, to provide analysis on why Joe Lomo has periscoped. Dr. Kula. Well, in a nutshell, uh, the thing speaks for itself. The legislative branch that we have currently is a reflection of what our people have voted for. In the past, George Weir just had to lift someone's hand and he got elected. They self-corrected after a while. They kicked everybody out that wasn't benefiting them and living up to what the legislative branch was supposed to live up to. And only certain people went back. So I think over time, as our electorate gets more educated, more informed, uh, they will start to make wiser decisions. Because the reality is if a man can hardly provide food for himself and just basically making it with the basics, uh, he goes to vote and sometimes he trades his votes in for money, for food for just to hear now, just to make it to the next day. That's the reality of poverty in Liberia. But I think it's incumbent upon the kids that are being sent to school by their market women mothers, by their Yana boy fathers, by their Shushan boy fathers, by their Pempe fathers, and other hardworking people in Liberia as your parents sent you to school, and as you get knowledge and as you get enlightened, it's incumbent upon you to go back and tell your parents about the issues that they should be voting for if you're not yet at the age to vote. And you tell them about the different characters. Scrutinize them completely. Don't let nobody tell you, say, oh, that a man private business. If the man house is a mess, He's obviously going to be a mess as a leader. If he can't keep his house together, he can't keep his family together, he can't manage his own finances, he does not live an exemplary life, he's a crook, he's going to be a crook when you give him power. So you let you, you, you discuss those things with your parents, but it's also incumbent upon all of the political parties, whether you're in the ruling party or you're in the opposition. You need to be able to educate our people so that they vote the right people in. You don't just go and present people because of little deals that you cross here and there at your conventions. We're gonna carry this man because of my sister boyfriend, my sister brother, or that my friend, or our man. You know, check your man, make sure your man has the proper character to be a leader because we're talking about a nation. And when we're talking about a nation where we have an impure presidency, the president usually gets his way. So if you don't have strong men in that seat in the legislative branch, quote unquote, the first branch, they are gonna be co-opted. And right now, as I see it, our legislative branch are all co-opted by the president. In the case of Ellen, it was brown envelopes we heard about that was going around. Look at that, brown envelopes, that's bribe. It's supposed to be illegal. And we joke about it. Here now with Ria, I don't know whether it's because he's got their wives in different positions or their relatives in different positions or what he's got on them, but he's got something on them to where he gets whatever he wants. So they're not men, they're like boys. And we cannot continue to run our country like kids. We have to be adults. There have to be some adults in the room. And one person stood up during this last election it was, it was Darius Dillon. He said he was going to go 
to the Senate and he was going to do the right things. He was going to let the people know how much they make. He was going to send some of the money back to the people so that everybody doesn't come begging him because it doesn't make sense for you to be the only one with money and everybody poor around you. He took a common thing that resonated with our people and he won. And I think we need to elect more Darius Dillons. I'm not saying Darius Dillons is the most perfect man. I'm not saying Darius Dillons is the best senator. I'm just saying he stood up for certain principles. We need more people that will stand up for principles, that will stand up for ideologies. Today, I saw a press conference that Edwin Stowe led where he decided now it's not going to be business as usual. He's going to stand up for certain principles. So hopefully, I think certain people are getting to the point where they're saying, if we allow this guy to go the route he's going, there will be no men in this town. We'll go back to the Taylor days again. We can't let that happen. So certain of us have to stand up. So hopefully mm -hmm. others will follow the footstep of Dylan and Representative Snow, where the first branch of government will now be the first branch where they looked at upon as our elders that speak truth to power and that allow that president to do the right things. Because I had a, a uh, an attending physician, he was a surgeon, he always used this word. He said, nature abhors a vacuum. Wherever there's a vacuum, nature will fill it. What he simply meant is, whenever there's a vacuum in any situation, something will fill it. Because the legislative branch has not been doing their job, COP rose up to fill the void that was left by the legislative branch. Now, everybody's upset at COP and upset at, 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 at Costa, but nobody was standing up. Nobody was talking back. Nobody was saying anything. They were just letting this man do whatever he wanted to do. So hopefully, as the legislative branch stands up, Costa and the COP and others can be think tanks and, and, and institutions that will continue to hold our feet to the fire, hold our government's feet to the fire, because it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. The opposition can still continue to talk. Our legislators can still continue to talk. Our legislators need to talk as a block. The opposition parties and the political parties need to hold their legislators in the House and the Senate to vote on their tickets. You cannot allow a man to come into the legislative branch and then he becomes an individual all of a sudden. That's how we've been running our country and it's not working. So that's my assessment on that. Posting cyberspace, Dr. Kula right there, providing critical analysis in this Periscope series on our government, the political party CDC, and all the political actors therein. Uh, gentlemen, I will give you a little break and then I will go to the live feed to read some comments. Uh, we have Deja Wright. Is there any effort to have this program relay or rebroadcast in Liberia? We will bring that to the attention and management so that we can look in that direction. Uh, and none of you are right. How do you build Liberia in your comfortable home in America? You think Liberia will be built through jumping on the show? All right, James David Wright, he used the money to pay some of his debts and you will never see any accountability or information about how the money was used. His groups of accountants are trying to balance the books. <laughs> uh, Agatha Shirley said, Costa has been arrested and is confirmed. Uh, she wrote earlier, I saw that Costa was trying to escape through a uh, free time she and was arrested. Uh, we don't know that to be true. We don't know. Uh, Merit to arrive, Mr. Gibman, these guys are speaking facts and not slaughtering. And then we have uh, Osanto Sambola, right? Thank you, guys. Uh, those are just few comments there. As we get more, uh, we will read them. And gentlemen, uh, let us go back to the Periscope series. At this time, we will move to the economy. And in our usual faction, we'll bring in Mr. Lobo. Mr. Lobo, you have been a good commentator 
on the incumbent, and many people follow you. Uh, talking about incumbent, let's look at growth indicators. The budget, the growth rate, inflation, community prices. Let's look at the standard of living, job creation, salaries. Uh, uh, go, over, go over that for me real quick. I want to look at it. I got it. We right. talk about growth rate indicators, growth rate, uh, inflation. Come on. Yeah, I got it. I'll read off of the phone. I got it for my. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. So, how is our government doing? Uh, this, is one, yeah. this is one very interesting topic to me, and I like to always bring it to the first. Uh, I will be, I will go ahead. So, let's begin with the growth indicators. Uh, you see, what are indicators? Indicators are all the things that we see that show that the country is progress, that the economy is. We look at liquidity or uh, excess liquidity in the banks. Right now, our banks are being liquidated. I mean, no money there. Uh, that is a problem. Uh, we look at employment. Uh, with employment, meaning when I say employment, I don't mean taking sedition names and putting it on payroll where you can't pay. That is not what I'm talking about. We look at employment, new jobs being created. Because we believe that when the government expands the economy, when there are more economic activities, then people will get higher. The more jobs are created. When more people are higher, then that means we talk about revenue increase in government. We talk about wealth creation, economic independence for those who are not getting those jobs. We also look at education. We want to look at what the government is doing or spending towards building the capacity of its citizens. Because we know that to have a skilled workforce, the more people we get educated, the better it is for the country. Uh, the more skill we give our people, the more financially independent they are and the more genuinely place they are to create wealth for themselves. Now, we also look at infant mortality. We look at death rate. We look at life expectancy. What is the government doing? This is why right now, there are so many different indicators you can look at right, when you're talking about growth in the economy. This is why one of the most generally accepted index that is being used now is the HDI, the Human Development Index. That is a generally accepted in, uh, index that is being used now to look at economies around the world, the HDI. Uh, because when you go by GDP, there's a lot of different things that make up the GDP. So people look at the Human Development Index because they believe that the more the people are developed, the more sustainable they are, the more reliable they are, the more their, their living standard is upgraded. You can easily attribute that to economic growth. Now, we also want to look at inflation. We want to look at prices. Uh, we want to look at consumer spending. What do we mean by consumer spending? We want to look at the number of people that can go to the market, how businesses are doing, especially in a country like Liberia, where almost 40% or 40 to 50% of its employment is in the informal sector. What do I mean by the informal sector, fellow Liberians? The informal sector of employment is the people that can wear neck tie and go to offices. So it's hard to count them. It is like the men who have been shining shoes for the last 10 years. That has been his job. Anything that you do to earn income as a source of living, it is a job. Once you work and earn income. So my auntie who owns a cobo shop for the last 20 years on a barber, that has been her only job. So she's working. She's not unemployed. The old man who basically drive me for the last 10 years. Those people, but now when consumer spending is down, they are affected because we know in the economy there's one thing we're concerned about when we talk about the trickle down effect, where it comes from the top down. Meaning, for example, let's use Liberia. Who is the highest employer in Liberia? It is the government. The government is the highest employer. If the highest employer don't pay her employee, what will happen to consumer spending? Will it go up or go down? It goes down. Because that means they don't have money. They can't go to the market to spend. What happened to businesses in the market? Will their business flourish? No, because nobody buying from them. What happened to their goods? If some of their goods are perishable goods that they can't sell in one, two days, those goods will spoil. 
We already don't have access to electricity. They say only 5% of the population of Liberia have access to, to, to electricity. So what happened? So all these different things, you can look at it. What are we doing? How much are we spending on education? What are we doing to mold the minds of the future generation of Africa? We know that we have skill deficit in Liberia. No, let me tell you, answer me. You see, many a time Liberians always talk about aid, aid, aid. But I want to challenge Liberians tonight to do themselves a favor and read about these aids. You will not believe that 700 million that was raised for Liberia in 2003, 2004. The United Nations told us that they spent 500 million on peacekeeping mission, but 200 million was spent on building capacities in Liberia. Now, of those 200 million, the United Nations 60% of our civilian staff came from outside Liberia. How do we create a wealth like that? When all the people who work for the UN, or the 200 million came from outside. Why? Because Liberia don't have skilled people. So we want to look at the Human Development Index as our metrics to calculate economic growth and life and improvement in the economy. Now, under this government, we look at economic activities, right? That is not happening under this government. Let me give you basic sectors. Liberia have always been one of those economies that have been heavily focused on the extractive sector. What do I mean by the extractive, the extractive sector? Meaning we have, we sign concession agreements where people will come to Liberia. It's either in the mining, the timber industry, which we call logging. People take the log, they cut the trees out, they clean it, they put on the ship and send it outside. People take the mine, they wash it, they put on the ship and send it outside. That have been our thing for the last hundred plus years. That have been our model. It has worked for us up to some time. Uh, Madam Sali will tell you since 2012, when the price of our two major exporting commodities went down, we saw a slow turn in our economy. We saw revenue fall. Our government began to recall budget shortfall in the tune of 30 to 35 million in 2014, 15, 16, and 17. But Ellen was able to cut expenditures and they were able to get the budget going. However, now let's look at George government. George, we are came to power before his ascendancy. The US rate in Liberia was 125 Liberian dollars to a dollar. Economic activities were going. Madam Saleem had decentralized. That's one thing Ellen did that we must commend her for. Madam Saleem had decentralized basic social services across the country. We saw banks in Grand Gita, banks in Ganta. I grew up in Ganta. I never saw a bank when I was in Ganta. To make matter worse, my dad was the bank manager for LBDI, even in Banga. There was no bank there until Ellen came to power. And when Ellen came to power, I left Liberia 2006, December, they were building those banks. So we saw banks being opened in those areas. So it promoted financial activities. We saw Madame Sally through an economic recovery agenda on the poverty reduction strategy to empower Liberians. We saw Mill Jones offering macro loan financing. Those are activities that stimulate economic growth because those people that were taking loans from government that were doing businesses, some of them were able to build homes for themselves, some of them were paying their children's school. Unfortunately, under this government, those activities no longer exist. I read yesterday that our uh, Echo Bank in Vondama is about to close down. What does that tell you? That the country is making progress? No. When those services begin to close because of poor performance, lack of economic activities, then the the labor sector will begin to shrink. Because when, El when Echo Bank closes in Bonjama, that means she have to let go her employees. Now, those other people will become unemployed, they will add to the number. So there are nothing, there's nothing happening under this government. You think about it. The IMF and the World Bank projected last year, in March, that our country economy will grow at 0.4% last year. And the World Bank told us, that until we took certain measures, until we put in reforms, monetary and fiscal policy reform, mobilize our domestic resources. And they said, if we did everything right, they said, we will not see growth until 2024. And sadly for you folks, in 2019, we didn't do nothing. 
So right now we have a situation of answering where banks have been liquidated. We have inflation at 33%. To make matters worse, in any normal society, when inflation is high, that means money that will work more yesterday is worth less today. What responsible governments will do is to give more money to the people because now you were making 300 last year. If inflation goes up, your 300 is not worth 300 today. But what did we see happen? During the time of a high inflation and a slow economy, the CDC government of George, we are back on a project, on a program called wage harmonization. To me, I think wage harmonization is the most professional way George, we are decided to make Liberia very, very poor. That is what he did. Because your money is worth less, but then they cut it what you make it. The money you make it worth less, but they cut it part of it. That was just, I don't know where they came from with that strategy. So you see that. So what happens if the man don't have enough and you cut it, that money? Is he going to spend money again? No, it's not possible because he don't have it. So when we talk, when we talk about economic growth under this government, there's nothing I can point out. Let's look at what the government have done to, to expand the economy. We told the CDC government upon coming to office that because the country was struggling, that there was a need for the government to diversify the economy. What do we mean by diversification of the, of the economy? Diversification of the economy simply means creating other avenues of opportunity to expand the economy, creating other avenues to raise revenue. We believe that if the government had invested in other programs to diversify the economy, that could have created jobs, that would have stimulated economic growth, that would have led to financial independence because the more people get employed, the better their life will be. But what did we see? Nothing. We told the government, we said, okay, diversify the labor economy. Look at the other sectors. Since we have been more of the extractive sector, what about we look at the productive sector of the economy? What do I mean by the productive sector of the economy? Meaning we, we, we go back to our concession agreements, see if we can be able to restructure some of those agreements that now bind some of those companies to establish factories. Why are we wanting to establish factories? Establishing factories, that is manufacturing jobs we're talking about, that will lead to employment. That will lead to more revenue because the more people that get employed, the more taxes come that will collect from this. Now, what does that do for Liberia? That will add value to our finished goods. What do I mean by adding value to our finished goods? For example, Firestone take the latest and bring it to America to produce tire. If we want to add value to our finished goods, then let's produce the tire in Liberia. Let's produce a rubber boat in Liberia. Let's produce a rubber bucket in Liberia. That is adding value. Or you will hear the economists will use the term value added. Or we channel mine. Let's produce steroid. Let's produce some of those things that steroid can produce, that we can use our iron ore to produce. We are in the process of building bridges. We are in the process of, of doing other things. So nothing has been done answering. So we are at a difficult stand still. The economy is not moving because nothing has been done to move the economy. And to, to say this, some of the things that have moved the economy as well, Anthony, it also takes government's action. Those things are done. The people will tell you in the book, there are only two policies that influence the economy, the monetary policy and fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is government spending and taxation that influence the economy. Monetary policy is carried out by the central bank. Nothing happening. So it is a sad story for our people, folks. We are in a difficult one. Get ready. Brace for the impact. There's nothing I can really show that showing you on this one. Thank you, Josh Lobo. Dad, periscoping the government on the economy. Again, folks, in cyberspace, this is focused on Liberia on our program, The Hour of Politics with me, Anselm Nsie. For today's series of our Periscope, we are periscoping the Liberian government. And we will now go to Dr. Kula. Uh, Dr. Kula, uh, time is a little fast spent, so we don't have much time. So I will allow you to quickly provide some analysis, and then uh, we can go to closing. Uh, go ahead. The analysis is simple. CDC came to power 
met a, an economy that was slowing down for all of the reasons that we know. We had had Ebola. Uh, we had had some hits in the economy from commodity prices and other things. Uh, but then CDC made it worse by coming in and then bloating the payroll with all their partisans. So you have a payroll that's supposed to take a certain amount of uh, people and you raise it up to, you know, how many million, you know, that's taken up all of our, our budget, so to speak. And then after you do that, then you say, let's go and harmonize because now uh, the World Bank and IMF have come in and they're getting you to do some structural adjustment. Now you're saying, let's harmonize the salaries and you're cutting people's salaries. So you're adding insult to injury. Then for whatever reason, the monies that were printed that were brought into the country doesn't get to the bank. You claim it was infused in the economy, but yet a shortage of Liberian dollar bills on the economy. Initially, you say there was too much. So you get 25 million to mop up the excess. You're supposed to hold this excess for a year. You don't hold it. You infuse it back into the economy, but yet we still have shortages of our own currency on the economy. And then you add more insult to injury by robbing Peter to pay Paul by doing extra budgetary spending after extra, extra budgetary spending. So these guys, for whatever reason, they've not sat down with their economic management team, with their finance minister, and thought of ways on how to keep the economy going. You can't slow down the economy by having our people not being paid for four months, six months, and whatnot. The vice president didn't go to the legislative branch because she was upset that she hadn't gotten her benefits and whatnot. Our uh, civil servants were going to protest because they weren't getting their monies. All of that slows down the economy. So what these guys need to do is to find a way to get the economy going, to also branch off into other things like tourism and other things that will bring in money into the economy. You got to use your head, heads more. That's, that's pretty much our economy in a nutshell. Dr. Kulada providing critical analysis on this Periscope series. Gentlemen, uh, let us conclude like this. Each of you will have about four minute marks to conclude. And for our conclusion, our government for two years now made some promises. We have about a ballet island, be as brief as possible. The electrification of the rubber International Highway all the way to Douala. We were told the lamp posts had come. Uh, we were also told about a coastal highway. Loans were initiated, you know, they initiated some process, says to uh, get the money. We know about the uh, Eton and Iboma. Those were the two efforts the government initiated. And uh, we heard also about stadiums, football stadiums to be built all around the counties. And then we have other pronouncements like Propo Rise, uh, 6,000 teachers. We also heard about the Clara Town, the Negro Town project, the Housing project, and all of that. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I would like you, Josh, you go first, uh, conclude on those things. And then uh, Dr. Kula will provide analysis. And then uh, we'll go back to our audience and be out of here. George. Let me, let me say this real clear in simple English. You know, uh, Dr. Kula said earlier today, they, they spoke about the dysfunction and this organized and of this party. He also made it clear that uh, they work in shadows because when you don't have long-term prosperity. You see, Anthony, when Jerry John Rollins took over Ghana, he built a vision, a vision that would set Ghana up for long-term sustainable growth and economic, uh, economic independence and financial stability. Jerry John Rollins began with very simple policies. He said, and I quote, he said, when I became president of Ghana, it was my responsibility to take education to every child in the village in Ghana. 
It was also my responsibility to give them access to electricity. That is how a leader will set a vision for the country long time. We saw that happen when the bulldozer took over in Tanzania. Unfortunately for us in our country, we elected George was a celebrity star. George Weah is the only president in the 21st century who vision for a country. Long term is a five-year plan. That in itself was a mockery to any normal person. A five-year plan died in, in, in the first 10 months. The plan was introduced in October of 2018. Before we got to October of 2019, we announced the funeral in the passing away of the Pope for Uganda of prosperity and development. So uh, today now, I think we have no plan. This is why the president is now building roads and is telling the Labyrinth people, he's building roads because boyfriend won't go see girlfriend and he don't want the boyfriend to walk in the mud. We told presidents we're building roads to, to improve economic activities. But the president is building road because he wants political attention. This is why the president has heavily devoted his time to re-inspecting or inspecting political law projects here in there. You build a road that is less than one mile, you want to lie to all. And today I want to conclude on one thing here that I've heard. Deputy Minister for Press and Public Affairs, Lamine Fagon, have dedicated himself to misinforming the public. Minister Fagon said this government will pave 635 kilometers of road. Let Mr. Fagon tell me, given that number, for him to, for this government to pave 635 kilometers, that means George, we are government. 605. <laughs> Look, I don't want, I don't want to go back and forth. Right? I will tell you like this. I want to just be very simple. Let Eugene Fagon tell us 135 kilometers road that George Weah, since he came to power, have gone out and sought funding for and have failed since he came to power. And I want them, I challenge them to tell the Liberian people all the roads they pay, let them put the cost out for us to see. If it is up to $12 million, it's another lie. But I will say this, folks, in my conclusion here. This is a scam. This government has no plan for you. This government has no intention to build the country long term. You mentioned about the Bali Island project. You mentioned about other projects. Yeah, President, we are do not think true. Policies are not made when you over happy. Policy decisions are not made because you took too many shots of Hennessy. Policies are not made because too many people went to the Jamaican resort and they asked you, Mr. President, will you build a valley? And they said, yeah, my man, you know, even this that. I will build a twin city. It don't work like that. These things must be carefully thought through. These things must be carefully studied. Our president have shown that he has poor judgment. Look at the housing project the president is building. In the 21st century, who built a housing project where your neighbor will know when you're taking shower? Your neighbor will hear you when you're laughing. Where does that happen? There's no spacing. Who builds a housing project in a community that is in the snow? A community that is being, that erosion is taking that community away, that is prone to natural disaster. Where you do that in the 21st century? But when you don't have vision like George, you settle for these little projects to give, to give your people who are complacent, who are quick to be satisfied, something to cheer something to laugh about, something to heal you, something to kneel down and worship the fake messiah, the false prophet, the fake pastor. That is all it is. This guy have no real plan. This guy have no solution to the economic challenges he's facing. And I'll tell you today again, leave, take care or leave it. Tomorrow will be yet the same as Timothy. This government will fail. And like I've said and will say, one day we will reveal the story. We will tell our children about a ship called the CDC. And we will explain to them that this ship, uh, this ship just sinks. And I want to conclude by saying to focus on Liberia, to uh, Baton Kula there. Uh, thanks to you guys for the time. To our fellow Liberians, wherever you're watching us from, to those of you who agree and disagree with me, 
I want you to leave from here with one. I want you to open your eyes and pay attention. The level of deception in our country is high. There's too much misinformation out there to continue to mislead. But you yourself will bear responsibility of your own future. Your destiny lies in your hands. You can continue to celebrate these thieves, these hustlers, these looters, these irresponsible professionals. You are putting your children's future, your own future at risk. Your life, your future is in your hands. I will be here to be watched. Thank you for the time and God bless the report. Thank you, Josh Loboda, with his closing periscoping statement, very critical, inspiring, but at the same time, tough talking Josh Lobo has laid out for you. We will now go to that. Uh, last, last, last week, Gilman, Mike, why Michael Gilman was on the show, periscoping the opposition. And unfortunately, I didn't get an opportunity to be on the show with him to give my analysis. And I noticed that one of his supporters is on here stating that uh, if Gilman was here, he will, he will set us straight. Well, I want to tell that person, I want to tell all Liberians that Gilman was allowed to come here unhindered to spew out whatever propaganda he wanted to spew out for the government unchecked by people like me. And Gilman put out a lot of lies related to uh, President We are sending out uh, doctors to uh, get extra training. President We are spending this amount of money for this and doing this for that and building roads and all of this. And the reality is I can speak for the medical aspect of it. A lot of what you see going on at JFK today, where you had President Weir, his wife going around showing the people JFK and dedicating and all of that, those were set in motion when Ellen Johnson Salif was in power by the Prevail study. The people who found the Ebola vaccine working at JFK, they have a floor there that looks just like an American hospital and they've been working there for a very long time. They are the ones through the USAID and the National Institutes of Health that got JFK to where it's at right now. We had nothing to do with it. The doctors that were sent to Kenya, that was set up through the Liberia College of Physicians, which was established in 2013. And through USAID and a uh, nonprofit called AIHA, they did a study on what it would take to get our residency program in Liberia up to, state, up to standard and accredited. And the recommendations that they made was that we send some of our uh, senior residents out of the country for training. That was set in motion when Ellen Johnson Salif was in power and 15 of those re uh, residents were sent to Kenya for extra training. We had nothing to do with it. What am I saying in a nutshell, my people? When people like Gilman come on here or go on his show and spew propaganda for the government, they're doing exactly what I said earlier. They've been shallow. They feel that like if they show you this, oh, the president did this, the president paid whatever, so you can, you can get impressed because they're all about fluff. They're very shallow. They're very superficial. There's no substance to them. Once all of the stuff that Ellen Johnson set in motion is no longer there and they have to, let's say, deal with the economy or deal with a particular policy prescription, they don't have the wherewithal to get our country where it needs to be. So what they'll do, they'll go around again, gathering people and showing you little community roads here and there. A two mile road here, a three mile road here, the road that was built in uh, McGill's yard because well, we I used to go there, it used to be muddy. The road I was built in Dual Community because that's where Mama Sikaba lives. The road I was built, uh, where, where we are live, those little roads here and there, that's what they will show you because they have no substance, nothing to show. Me. So what I want our people to do, if you don't do it, we will try to do it for you. We'll read these things, these documents, whether it's the, 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 uh, the, the uh, uh, residency program document, whether it's the basic package of health services that was done 
under Ellen Joss Saleem, the document that was put together, whether it's the essential package of health service, we'll come here and discuss it with y'all and tell y'all what you should have based on policy prescriptions that were put in place by Ellen Johnson Saleem. Not this ruling by Fiat. All this is is a list. Oh, I'll do Bali Island, we'll, we'll build Twin Cities, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll build coastal highways, uh, we'll build small stadiums, we'll do the pro Bowl rise, 6,000 teacher, housing project. All of these things are what you call reading by, right, uh, ruling by fiat. Just coming out, knee jerk decisions with no thought processes, no policy prescriptions, nothing because you're shallow. You wanna show you're doing something. You're being a busy bee instead of doing the hard and heavy lifting. We need more serious people in our government and we need to hold our government feet to the fire. 50 houses in 60 days, when in fact those houses didn't even belong to you. They didn't even take the time to go and find out who the houses belong to. They could have taken the time to even find out whether these people are renting houses from people and who are the people they're renting it from. So now you have a problem where after they build the house now, the owners came and said, you get out. Now they got people that can pay them more for living in the house. Does that make sense? You use government money to build houses for private people and they've kicked the people out and they're getting more money for it. You take money from one place and go and zinc houses and made it seem like it was your money that you were using, not knowing it was government money. Shallow, no vision, incompetence, mediocrity, confrontational, dysfunctional, corrupt, nepotistic, tribalistic. 50% or more of the government is Southeastern. That's not coming from me. That came from a government official that I talked to today. He said over 50% is Southeastern. Tribalistic and nepotistic. We have to do better, Mr. Weir. You promise our people change. We can only hold you to your word. Give our people change and give them good change. Let's stop all this calling people names, calling them enemies of the state, calling them hater, calling them jealous, saying that people don't want you because you're from, from Gibraltar. No, at a certain point in time, you got to look yourself in the mirror and say, man, it's something I'm doing that's not right because everybody loved you to death. Everybody was willing to give you a chance. So it's not anything to do with Gibraltar or Charles. It has to do with you. You are not a leader. Become a good leader for your people and you will see everybody will rally in your corner and love you. But I can't bring investors to the country when you're telling my investor they have to pay McGill money or you're telling me I have to be in the CDC before I can bring investors. You can't do that to your people. Let's open up our economy. Let's treat our people right. Let's rule according to our heads, thinking things through and not shallow. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless Liberia. Dr. Kula there with a critical, critical and detailed analysis on this Periscope series. Dad, we want to thank you, folks in cyberspace. We want to thank you, Mr. George Lomor, the chief Periscoper. We want to thank you. You guys did great. You came here and you were given a piece of job to do, to provide analysis that we call Periscope on our government. And we couldn't have been happier with all you've done. To those who are not happy with what they've done, the platform is here. Reach out to us and we'll give you the opportunity to say your own. Yeah, I focus on Liberia. We welcome everybody. Guess what? Tomorrow, we are bringing pro-government women here. Women who support the proper government. Tomorrow at 7 p.m., we are breaking them here and they will have their time to talk their own. We bring everybody together to talk about our government. To those in government, if you are not happy with anything you heard here, come here and defend yourself. Folks in cyberspace, thank you for spending almost two hours with us. To our guests, again, we want to say thank you. The Periscope series was very informative. Next Tuesday is the last series in the Periscope series. This time around, we will be periscoping Facebook politicians, Facebook advocates, those who are in the social media world, who have political pundits. We will be periscoping them. And George Lobo, the old George Lobo will be among those who will also be periscope. Yasini will be periscope, Emmanuel Save, Michael Gibman, Chief Kali, Al Fariga. Uh, Classic D, Prophet Key, Francis Doe, Prince Sharif, all these people 
who are in the business of advocacy and uh, politics on Facebook, there will be Periscope. Maybe I'll be Periscope too. Maybe Dennis Jazz will be a Periscope. So folks, thank you for coming. This show will be on YouTube in the next one hour. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every show that we broadcast here on Facebook is on YouTube in the next two, three hours. Thank you for coming. Gentlemen, we want to thank you for honoring our invitation. This is how we will leave you. Thank you, guys, and bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the Republic. Thank you. Uh,